In today's lesson, we're going to focus on the atomic structure. So we're actually going to look at what makes up an atom and how do we define an atom and things like that. We're going to look at these kind of things in terms of the way an atom is put together and how that affects what it can do. So this is a really common picture. Um, we see you know, in the middle there's a nucleus and then whizzing around like planets is, an is the electrons. And that's a really common visualization of an atom. So the general structure of the atom is similar to the structure of the solar system. Okay, that's what we've sort of grown up knowing. And then we call that the Bohr model. So at the center is the nucleus, that pink dot is the nucleus. And within the nucleus, positively charged particles called protons and neutral particles called obviously neutrons can be found. So this central nucleus has protons and neutrons. Now orbiting the nucleus are smaller negatively charged particles, which we call electrons. And remember, there's always equal numbers of protons and electrons in any atom only ever electrons and protons, they're the same in every atom. They'll always be the same number. So how do we define an atom? So atoms can be differentiated using two numbers. So how do we define a particular atom is what we're saying. The mass number and the atomic number. Atoms of a particular type can be, you can tell everything you need to know about them about with two numbers, the atomic number and the mass number. Now the way this is structured depends on what periodic table you're looking at. So you've got always the symbol, that, that's always the same but you could have the name at the bottom. Now the atomic number is usually an integer number. Actually, it has to be an integer number. So you don't see any decimal points. And that can go, it could be at the top. Don't be confused if it is at the top. It's always integer valued and it's at the top. And the atomic mass is this decimal number. It's the weighted average of the total atomic masses of different isotopes. So the atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus of the atom. So the atomic number, this number, is the number of protons in the nucleus of that particular atom. That explains why this number is always an integer, because you can't have 0.5 of a proton. That doesn't make sense. This number has to be integer valued, and that's why, because it's the number of protons in the nucleus. All atoms of the same element will have the same atomic number. Every atom of the same element will have the same atomic number, and so that tells you that every element is defined by the number of protons that it has. So oxygen will always be oxygen if there's eight protons. Anything with one proton will have to be hydrogen. Anything with two protons has to be helium. So you can see that's how we define atoms. Now the mass number, which is not listed here, is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So it's the number of protons, which is the atomic number, plus the number of neutrons. So that's what the mass number is. It's very, very close to the atomic mass, though it does vary a little bit. Now the mass number, separates different isotopes of the same element. We have another differentiation called isotopes. These isotopes have different neutrons, different numbers of neutrons in their nucleus from one another. For instance, we can have carbon that has six neutrons, could have seven neutrons or eight neutrons, but that doesn't change the fact that it's carbon. It's just a different form of carbon and we call that a different isotope. So we use the mass number to separate isotopes from one another. And then we can clearly define any substance that we find in the planet. So we're moving away from the nucleus now and we're going to the orbital parts. Electron. So the nucleus defines what an atom is. The nucleus tells us what the atom is. But the electron configuration, so the way the electrons are structured or put together, defines the chemical properties of the atom. So the atom has particular chemical properties, like it's, it's reactive or it's not reactive, those kind of things. The way the electrons are arranged, or the electron configuration, it tells us all about those properties of that atom. Now the electrons orbit around the nucleus in specified distances or orbits, known as shells. So what I mean by that is, if this is the nucleus here, you can have an electron here maybe, and an electron here, but you can't have an electron sitting in between. That doesn't exist, that doesn't happen. So they sit in very particular places around the nucleus. And if you think about it, that happens sort of similarly in the solar system. You've got Mars, Earth, and all the other planets orbiting a particular place around the sun. They don't kind of interject and sort of move left and right or towards the sun or away from the sun. They always stay in the same orbit. And that's similar to what happens with electrons. They always stay in the same orbit, and that orbit is well-defined. And we call that a shell. So the orbit, we call a shell. Now the further away the electron is from the nucleus, the greater the energy that the electron is said to possess. The further I am away from the nucleus as an electron, the more likely I am to have more energy. And that kind of makes sense from a planetary point of view as well. So if I hold this pen up here and I drop it, it hits the ground at a certain speed. Now if I take this up higher, further away from the Earth, and I drop it, 
it will hit at a faster speed. That kind of intuitively tells you that as I take it higher and higher, it has more and more energy because it can hit the ground much faster than when I was lower down. So the same thing applies here. The further I am away from the nucleus, the more energy I'm said to have as an electron. So the shells, because of that, the shells are also said to be called energy levels of electrons. One shell is one energy level, next shell out is another energy level, etc. The goal of an atom is simply to achieve stability. So here, this atom, sodium, wants to achieve stability. This stability occurs when the octet rule, so here's an important one, the octet rule, is satisfied. So this is probably the key thing in chemistry that we need to learn first. When an atom satisfies this octet rule, a stability is achieved. So what is the octet rule? This rule essentially means that a full outermost shell of electrons is required for stability. We have to fill the outermost shell of electrons in order to achieve stability. But how many do we have to fill it with? And also, shells must be full before electrons can start filling higher shells. So for instance, I can't just start putting electrons here by taking electrons out of this inner shell because they have to be full before I can fill the next shell out. I can't have these electrons moving in here to simply satisfy my octet rule. There's two parts to the rule, essentially. Okay, so how many shells do we actually need? Or how many electrons do we need in each shell? So in the first shell, two electrons are needed to fill it. So this is a bit of a, a weird one, but just remember that the first shell, the closest shell, needs two electrons. So helium has two electrons. If you look at the atomic number of helium, it's two, which means it has two protons. And if it has two protons, it has two electrons. There's only one shell to start with, so the electrons must fill that shell. Helium is very, very stable, and that explains why. Because it's got a full outer shell of electrons with only two, and so it's extremely stable. It doesn't want to react with anything, because it doesn't need to. Now it gets a little bit more complicated. Therefore, an atom that only has one shell needs two electrons to achieve stability. So helium has two electrons, and so it's very stable. However, hydrogen has only one electron, so it's not as stable as helium. So it's missing an electron here, which means that it's not stable. And you can see that if you light hydrogen on fire, it will burn. But if you light helium, try to light helium on fire, it'll just do nothing. It'll just get hot. So you can see there's a difference. All shells after the first require eight electrons. After this shell, so the next shell out, if I was to draw it, and that one would need eight electrons. And if you look back at sodium, it has one electron in its outermost shell, but then each one on the inside is eight, and the innermost one has two. Okay, so this shell needs eight electrons. And you can see eight is the prefix oct, so you can see why it's called the octet rule, because you need eight electrons in each shell going outwards until you achieve stability. That's why we call it the octet rule, because it always has to do with eight. So that concludes today's lesson on the atomic structure. We've looked at what the atomic structure is. There's the nucleus on the inside and then the electrons orbiting the outside. And we've looked at how elements and atoms achieve stability and the octet rule and what that is. So that's what we've covered today. And so we'll move on to the question segment and hopefully we'll learn something about this section of work. So boron has a mass number of 11. Determine the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. So the mass number is 11. So we need to think about this very carefully. So let's consult our periodic table. We know its mass number is 11. You can see this atomic mass is pretty close to 11. So boron here is there, and the mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So if you're with me so far, this is okay, because we're just looking at our periodic table now. Atomic number, the number of protons, is the atomic number, and it's here. It's always the integer number. The number of protons, or the atomic number, is 5. So the number of protons is also 5. So we put that into our equation. So 11 equals the number of protons, which is 5, plus the number of neutrons. The number of neutrons would just simply be 11 minus 5, which is 6. And that's how we work these things out. So if the atomic number defines a particular element and the mass number defines an isotope, define the term isotope. Isotopes are atoms of an element that have differing numbers of neutrons to one another. For example, carbon can have 6, 7, or 8 neutrons. Each of these atoms is an isotope of carbon. The one that has six is considered an isotope of, a, of carbon. The one that has seven is an isotope of carbon. And the one that has eight is also an isotope of carbon. So you can see that they're just different atoms with differing numbers of neutrons. And that's all an isotope is. So briefly define what an atom is. So we may have covered what the structure is, but we need to know what an atom actually is. So an atom is the smallest unit of an element. Okay? An atom is simply the smallest thing that you can get, smallest indivisible object of an element. It cannot be subdivided into small particles and still retain the characteristics of that element. So the first part of that sentence is deceiving because you can split an atom into subatomic particles. You can have protons, neutrons, and electrons. 
But the difference is that if you were to do that, none of those particles would retain the chemical characteristics of that element. So for instance, if I took hydrogen, um, let's make it different, helium, it's like helium. It has two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. If I was to break all of them up into their parts, neutrons, protons, and electrons, they don't share the properties of helium. They are just protons, neutrons, and electrons. So they're not the smallest thing that retains the chemical characteristics. And that's what an atom is. The smallest thing that an element can be, that still retains all of the chemical characteristics of the element. So that's an important distinction that you want to make when answering you know, sort of these defined questions. So using electron configurations, is the sodium atom stable? So let's see if we can work this out. So here we have sodium. It's got 11 as its atomic number, as you can see, which means it has 11 electrons. So now each shell has to be filled before the next shell can start filling. So the first shell can only take two electrons, so a new shell is needed. We've got a total of 11 electrons. First shell takes two. So how many do we have left? Nine. After we use another shell, we take out the second shell takes eight. Then how many do we have left over? Two plus eight is 10, so we have one left over. So one remains. And therefore it starts a new shell. So in the third shell, we have only one electron. And if you look back on the diagram that we had of sodium before, you'll see there's only one electron orbiting in the third shell. This shell has only one electron and therefore is short by seven. And so the sodium atom is unstable because it doesn't have eight in its atom shell. Using electron configurations again, is argon stable? So you have argon, it's got 18. So the number of electrons equals eight because proton number equals 18. Number of protons equals the number of electrons. So we have 18 electrons. The first shell stores two. So the remaining electrons is 16. Taken two and put them in the first shell. So we have 16 left over. The second shell takes eight electrons. So we take eight from our 16 and we put them in the second shell. So we have eight left over. And then the third shell takes another eight electrons. So we take another eight from our eight and we have zero electrons left over. And then the third shell has eight electrons. So it's got the full eight, which means it must be stable. So the outermost shell, the third shell, has eight electrons. So the argon atom must be stable. So that concludes today's lesson on the atomic structure. So we've looked at what the atomic structure is and how electron configurations influence the chemical characteristics of a particular element or atom. So I look forward to seeing you at our next lesson.